Hello, and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 809th New Social Environment. I'm oh. Chloe, Director of Programs here at the Rail, and I have the tremendous pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation featuring Robin Cost Lewis and Joan Key. We'll conclude with a reading by Robin Cost Lewis as well. Before we get started, the Brooklyn Rail acknowledges Black Lives Matter. Here in New York, we're on Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Munsee, and Lenny Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. We recognize land acknowledgments are not a replacement for necessary decolonial work, but serve as a reminder of place, of the legacies of dispossession and enslavement that sustain and enrich the stolen land that we're speaking from. And now it's my pleasure to introduce today's guest and host. Robin Cost Lewis is the author of Voyage of the Sable Venus, winner of the National Book Award for Poetry, and a finalist for the Hurston Wright Legacy Award and the Los Angeles Times Book Prize, among many other recognitions. The former poet laureate of Los Angeles, she holds a PhD in poetry and visual studies from the University of Southern California. Her work has appeared in the New Yorker, the Paris Review, and many other journals. Lewis has taught at many universities and is the author most recently of To the Realization of Perfect Helplessness, winner of the 2023 NAACP Image Award for Outstanding Literary Work in Poetry. And our host today, Professor Joan Key, teaches in the history of art at University of Michigan and is a Ford Foundation scholar in residence at MoMA. Her book, The Geometries of Afro-Asia, Art Beyond Solidarity, engages with Black and Asian artists and the vibrant worlds they initiate through their works and was just released by the University of California Press. An occasional public interest lawyer in Detroit, we are extremely lucky to have Joan Key as an editor at large at the Brooklyn Rail. And with that, it's my pleasure to pass it over to Joan. Thank you so much, Chloe, and also special thanks to you, our uh, beloved audience, for joining us today. Uh, one of the things I, I, we talked a little bit about, so before getting into, say, the work, um, Robin, um, is there anything that you would like to say before we start with a clip from your, frankly, magisterial work, Intimacy? Thank you, Joan. Uh, Besides, thank you for coming and thank you for supporting my work to the audience and to everyone who made this uh, event happen. Um, no, but just thank you. Thank you, Joan, for asking. That's very kind. So I, uh, we realized that not everyone has yet had an opportunity to see intimacy. If you have not, um, we strongly encourage you to do so. It is a work that will make you rethink the elasticity of time or what time actually entails. Uh, and so, uh, Chloe, could I uh, very kindly ask you to show a clip from uh, Robin's uh, new work? Sometimes, instead of going forward, I try to go further back, beyond 14 billion years. I try 15 billion, 16 billion, 60 billion, long before our planet was ever created. Sometimes the small girl in me wonders if all of our universes are a roux roiling inside a large stone cauldron, inside the warm midnight blue kitchen of the infinite black sorceress who lives inside my cells. Sometimes I can't stop thinking about the fact that before Mao Zedong became a genocidal murderer, he was first a librarian. Quantum and 
entanglement. Something female inside me knows that she is evolutionarily expected to wake up in the middle of the night and stare through the dark and wonder. All the worlds spinning beneath me, toggling. I have been thinking about you again today, as I do so often think of you, wondering if people can see the sky of our childhood the way we still see the sky whenever we think of each other. Well, not see, but feel the way every feeling has a trillion eyes. So that is really just but a very, very brief uh, taste of what I guess riches are in store if you go to Marion Goodman Gallery and see the work in its entirety. <laughs> the first question I have, and this is a question I think that also your work asks is, again, where do we begin? Uh, how is it that you found the photographs or rather how did they make their way to you? How does this perhaps fit in into um, sort of the longer arc of the work you've been doing so far, because I'm, am I correct to understand that this is your first uh, video installation? Is that right? Yes. Um, when you said, where do we begin? I thought you were making a meta historical statement. And I was like, yes, <laughs> exactly. Uh, that's it in a nutshell. How do we, uh, imagine um, the frame around our history mm -hmm. before we even get to the so-called histories, um, which are deeply problematic. Uh, but so uh, that's really my answer to the question that wasn't a question, but uh, you asked, where did, I, where did I begin this process or this installation? I think it was the latter. Um, I, I discovered a very unique archive under my grandmother's bed after she died accidentally. And what was most amazing to me about it is that I was the last person in her house before the house was raised a few days later because uh, the church next door wanted her property, which was so beautiful, um, including what I say so beautiful, I'm actually thinking about her garden. Uh, to in South Central Los Angeles, what's now known as South Central, to make a parking lot. So for example, whenever I go home, I always go to my grandmother's house, but I'm going to a parking lot. Mm -hmm. um, and so I discovered these photographs, these in the installation are perhaps the 10th, maybe, mm -hmm. or the eighth of uh, the, the whole archive. And um, when I found it, I, I keep saying this everywhere. I think it's important for me, sorry, <clears throat> to keep repeating, is that I just knew that um, my mind wasn't mature enough uh, to understand what I had discovered. Mm -hmm. um, and I also had no intention. I wasn't even thinking about a book. But um, as time went on, I, I realized that that was what I should do. And then I realized once I started the book that Actually, that's not the point. Um, it's one of the points, um, but there was also this urge in me to see the images projected. And mm. I had no training whatsoever. I also had no training in the history of photography. So that's why I did the PhD in um, visual studies. So I could understand what I was looking at historically um, from the paper, from the reason why the image that we have up right now, why is there rust on there? Why, you know, why is the color so vivid? Why is it a square uh, print and not a rectangular print? Well, all of these things um, I wanted to understand because uh, Joan, you and I have talked about it before. Um, I just think that the paper confesses m m as much history if not the images themselves. And before I go on, I just wanna say, um, what a tremendous honor it is to be in conversation with you, Joan. I'm a huge fan of your work and 
I still can't believe that I even get to know you or sit with you and talk. So thank you. Oh, that's really the honor is all mine. And the points that you just raised are so illuminating because in the course of the work, um, the images, they most of them have traces of being handled. So some are some are look like they've been torn. Some have been uh, look like they might have been burnt. Some may look like they've been. Uh, uh, there's a lot of fading that's involved, yes. and it, it really, you know, the this the decision, I guess, not to make it perfect and sort of smooth and gal. I guess, um, uh, what is it? Uh, mm -hmm. I guess uh, market ready, uh, if you will, is yes. that in some ways that do those traces also hint at maybe casual or real violence that a picture might have been ripped in anger or it might have been dropped or thrown away are those emotions or not so much emotions are those resonances are um center is that part of the work as well because it seems like you're really trying to also struggle from the photographs not participating in some sort of nostalgic enterprise exactly um, well, the words you said at the beginning of this question was, you know, they look like they had been torn, they look like they had been dropped, they look like this, they look like that. And I wanted to interrupt you, but I'm trying to stop interrupting people so much, so I did it. Oh, no, go for it. Because <laughs> what I was going to say is, and isn't that exactly what's happened to diasporic people? And I think the metaphor the of the kind of material history of the paper upon which the photographs were treated was for me, again, the more interesting or equally interesting um, uh, kind of deep, deep source of uh, engagement for me. Because, you know, on the one hand, like diasporic people, we survived. On the other hand, we all have cracks, tears, wrinkles, right? We grade, in the case of this image right here, you know, I know that's because of an, another photographic um, process, but you know there are parts of us who, that are standing in a sea of stars, like these little boys' legs and his father's feet, and then there are parts of us that are in the sunshine. There are parts of us that are dark and lost, and we can't feel the bottoms of our bodies. But there are parts of us that are also, you know, very well protected by um, our, and in this case, the father stands in for me. Um, community. So I was really interested uh, in the paper. And I can't tell you how many people, not my fabulous press Knopf, um, kept asking me, when are you going to retouch the photos? And anytime somebody asked me that or thought that, I just kind of walked away and knew not to engage any further. <laughs> so thank you for paying attention to the material here. So I, really, I mean, there's something about also the way in which you honor fading that lets the viewer know that you're not it's not about thinking of darkness as necessarily bad but rather about how is it that darkness or shadow is also a form of embrace and i, I found that quite striking exactly. throughout the work as well now the other um another question i wanted to ask is your use of blank screens because it's we see photographs but then you you also give viewers a moment of rest or pause and there's a blank screen and sometimes there's a quote. My favorite one was, um, we wish for maps which have never existed. I touch myself with history. And I'm yes. curious to know some of your thoughts about bringing in sort of that, um, I, I guess it's a welcome darkness almost. Absolutely. Say that again. Hallelujah. Exactly. I mean, we've been so indoctrinated to think of light and whiteness as a place of respite, as a place of safety. And uh, I got very exhausted when I was doing my PhD and other research in photography. We constantly hear about how uh, photography is an art of light. In fact, the name speaks of it, speaks to that history. Um, and the thing that's so interesting to me, I always am waxing metaphorical when I would be in these lectures and classes, is I would just think about in order to make a photograph, you need darkness, right? You can't get there without it. In, in, in all of its history from early, you know, even to our phones, like you need the darkness and how that was, that fact is entirely erased. And again, you know, metaphorically to me, that speaks volumes um, about our history uh, in terms of uh, colonization. Mm -hmm. So uh, that was really important to me 
I wanted to figure out a way to plunge the reader into darkness and a darkness that was like blackness for me, an exquisite place to be. Mm. There was no, there was, you know, at the time that I grew up and, and even now still, we use monikers like black and dark as these neg with, with so much and the negation around it, so much negativity around it. Mm. You know, you hear kids speaking on the playground, they're like, oh, that, I don't like that color black or, and the way they say black, it's like black. If you really listen, right? And the way they say white is like white. I mean, it's everywhere. I'm just talking about colors. I'm just talking about perception. I'm not talking about people. I'm not talking about race. I'm not talking about diaspora. Um, and so I wanted, I mean, I wanted to do many things with this project, but one of the things I very much wanted to do and why I'm so grateful to Marion Goodman Gallery. I mean, I hope you guys go and see it. The gallery is exquisite and, it, and, the, and, the, and it's lush. The darkness is lush and velvety and quiet. It's just such a warm place. And uh, Emily Jane Kerwin, who I work with at Marion Gutman, you know, when I saw it, I, the gallery after it had been installed, I said, exactly, exactly. And so just in these um, not so didactic ways, uh, I really like to work underground and quietly and metaphorically, I don't like to, clobber anybody over the head with anything. I mm -hmm. think that the viewer, it's the viewer's experience um, to be in that room and see what they see, feel what they see, see, feel. And so it was more like I just wanted to create uh, a kind of very dark, comforting place. Mm -hmm. and, and that darkness means many things, you know? Does it mean race? Of course it does. And no, it doesn't mean race. It means blackness. <laughs> it doesn't mean race. Does it mean, you know, the stars and space? Of course it does. Does it mean the womb? Of course it does. Does it mean love and an embrace? Of course it does. Does it mean community? Yes. Does it mean the beginning of time? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Right? All of those things. And that took a lot of time. <laughs> that took a lot of time to figure out how to uh, make it work. And I'm not I'm not sitting here saying that it works. I hope it works. Um, but that those were my goals. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. And that within that, to reposition Black figures, particularly Black Americans, within a vaster history, because in the United States, I mean, I, you guys, I'm so frustrated. I'm turning 59, and I've worked my whole life uh, in culture and fighting racism. And every single day, even the most astute minds you know, blurt out the most idiotic, insulting things mm -hmm. all day long. I'm, I'm, I'm really um, exhausted by these kinds of engagements. So I really also wanted to uh, have us think in a country that is so myopic in its history, that this country is 400 years old. I really appreciate the la land acknowledgement at the beginning of the program, and I really appreciate the addendum to what is now a genre, <laughs> we turn everything into a genre of the land acknowledgement by saying, it's just a land acknowledgement. That's, that's a beginning, it's a first step, but we have a lot of work to do. Mm -hmm. I feel the same way about um, this installation, you know, and where I sit, it's like, it's just a first step to abolish American time. It's mm -hmm. just a first step, you know, to try to get readers and listeners and viewers to think, wait a minute, wait a minute, four centuries, that's nothing, mm -hmm. that's nothing. And, and black people didn't begin four centuries ago. But the way I was taught was that, you know, before we became slaves, we were monkeys. And, and literally those were in our, that was in our textbooks, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's an attempt to try to take these figures. Now I am talking about the images themselves. Uh, I really wanted to recontextualize blackness in a timeline that was so vast that it never ended in any direction, because it doesn't. And also movement too, because I was just um, yes. you know, thinking about Afro, um, you know, Asian movements that it's not just yes. people moving from Asia to Africa that what, 450,000 years ago, now, exactly. there's now evidence of people from Africa sailing all the way to what is now Papua New Guinea. There, there's Absolutely. Of that. And so one, yes. of the, one of the real sort of um, 
strengths that I that I draw, drew from your work is also thinking about how is it that time is something that's all, one malleable, but also thinking about how is it that we don't just stay in place, that there is a flow, there is a pacing. And this is also why I found your vo the voicing of your words really important. It doesn't overshadow the images. I think you took a lot of care to make sure that didn't happen. But there's also something about the way in which your voice measures or kind of thinks about every artwork as a sort of an interval that then can be expanded into its own world. And I I, I would love to hear more about um, yep, some of the decisions that you made in terms of sound, in terms of uh, the, 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 the words that you use, the, the pacing, your tone, things like that. So. Oh, that's beautiful. Uh, well, I should start with thinking the artists and my, at the time, and I've now lost her and I'm heartbroken, studio uh, assistant and creative producer, Emily Rose, who's now doing graduate work in London, I could just die. Mm -hmm. But the reason why I think the work has the kind of meticulous lushness that it does is because she took so such monumental care with the photographs. We worked together, but she was so willing to, um, really take time to scan these images like I mean it, it was just it took us a couple of years just to scan them um, mm -hmm. in this way um, so I just wanted to say that about uh, the person behind the person um, and so let me see Jenna I really forgot what you said because I was thinking about uh, Emily when you were talking I, I, and then I how just... I need to stay thank her oh. <laughs> sorry no. I'm old you guys no, no I was uh, you know just curious about um how you thought about sound almost as a oh, yeah. collaborator. So sure, absolutely. Um, well, God, it's such a great question. So first and foremost, poetry is the lyric and the lyric is music. And what the instrument I feel that I play is language as opposed to a horn or a piano or something like that. And I take that very, very seriously. Um, I also think that to be read to is one of the most, or to be told a story is one of the most primordial things that human beings can do with each other. And so both those things were very important to me as I wrote this piece for Julie Moretu because I mean, I guess I should say that too, that the piece is written for my friend, Julie, um, in a way that I was trying to, and it ties into your question, uh, hold the history of human history, but also uh, how often human beings move, migrate because they're fleeing something. In the case of Julie Moretu, she her family was fleeing the war in Ethiopia, and uh, and in my case, you know, my family was fleeing the apartheid South, and that that history of both fleeing and exploration, both right, the history of photography as I was taught it, and was about the history of documenting move human movement. And and that within that, human beings have been moving since we were upright and before. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we've been migrating a long time. As I joke with the author, Kevin Young, you know, the whole idea of the African-American great migration, I wanted to explode the, the idea of great migration to exactly what you said, Joan. You know, there, there's a line in this installation that says 40,000 years ago, there wasn't a continent that had not borne our footprint. And it's because I am, in fact, uh, evoking the history that you just talked about, about Africa and Papua New Guinea, New Guinea. There's just so many migrations that occurred for tens of thousands of years uh, that we haven't even begun to really think about. And we certainly don't think about Black people in America or any, any person of color in America having anything great to do with that. You know, one of the, for me, greatest heist of all times was in academia where they convinced me that art began in the caves of Lascaux and that justified you know western the, the west is kind of centered and and exalted place in the history of art it's really smart when you think about it mm -hmm. but you know we have since found all these caves 
and all over the world, right? Uh, where people have been making art in caves much, 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 you know, older than Lascaux and all the caves in Europe. But we don't talk about that. It isn't corrected, right? And that's the prime, as far as the way I was told, that was the prime way that we were taught was the justification for our enslavement and for the greatest art in the world. There's a reason why Rome and Greece are still the most traveled to vacation spots, because that's where it all began, supposedly, right? And so I just wanted to make a piece that could really, in a very quiet way, very, very quiet, not let me tell you about yourselves, right? That's not my agenda. I don't ever want to be the Black woman on a stage preaching to white people about how horrible colonialism is. That is not, I, I, I can't tell you how much I'm not interested in that. At the same time, though, I am interested in, in evoking and clarifying history and using material culture, in this case, uh, vernacular photography to do so. Mm -hmm. I still haven't answered your question, sound. Um, I want to sing to the reader in a way that the reader doesn't know they're being sung to, the lyric. I think that if you speak to a person in a particular way, you can disarm them. And at every point, as a writer, as an artist, you have to, I think, I have to figure out a way to, dis, to, to, to convince the viewer to take off their armor. And I can't do that if I'm screaming, right? So if you use these photographs, as I have, to say, you know, there's nothing wrong with being nostalgic. You know, uh, the great filmmaker, uh, Cecilia Doffrey always told me about this project, use nostalgia, don't be nostalgic. Mm -hmm. So I use this nostal I use these photographs nostalgically to disarm the viewer, but also to do all those other things I talked about. But then I use the sound and the lyric and the meter, right? Um, this is really heady poetry stuff. So I'm trying to make it like simple, but to to kind of, sing to the reader, I mean, sorry, the viewer, without the viewer knowing I'm singing to them so that they can kind of just take a deep breath and relax. So then like comedy, right? Once you're disarmed, then you can actually say something real. I was actually thinking when I was, so I, I went to visit your work every day this week because- Oh my God. Uh, it, because, you know, looking also is a diaristic activity that in order to really look long and closely that it you can't just sit there for an hour and just go home and it um, kind of struck me that um, the way you speak it it's really resonant I, I don't know Sanskrit and I know you've studied it extensively but uh, it Gosh. seems that the the highly metrical form of Sanskrit poetry has yeah. a real kind of correspondence with the way in which you approach verb or how you verbalize uh, each syllable or each word so uh, i was wondering if you could speak a little bit about that oh my god yes um it's just not it's not just sanskrit but although sanskrit is a, a musical language you know when i was studying sanskrit they would say you know there's a camp that you can go to academics can go to where you only speak sanskrit mm -hmm. for a week but the real truth of the matter is you can't speak it it has to be sung so you're at a conference where people are singing, hello, how are you? I'm going to the have some food, but it's all being, everything is sung. You can't, you're not, you, it, it's considered a little bit like um, blasphemous to speak Sanskrit as opposed to sing to it, sing it. It's a very musical language. But I think that it's not just Sanskrit, but I'm so moved that you understand this, Joan, and could hear it. It's liturgy, it's liturgical languages. I'm very, I went to divinity school, I'm a theologian by training, and I'm very um, drawn to, uh, you know, the way, the cantos, the way in which we, um, Elizabeth Alexander's praise song, right, the ways in which we engage. And it's been proven, just like, you know, it's been proven about Papa Nguyenia, it's been proven that certain meters can relax the body more than others. Right. And and so it's very much a kind of, you know, iambic um, meter throughout. But then I really believe it. every person has their little song. And mm -hmm. so the um, incredible recording studio where Mary Gutman um, arranged for me to record this, the vocals for this, mm -hmm. I got to work with a man who it turns out 
had a background in poetry. And so after we had worked together for a couple of hours, he was like, I got it. And I was like, what do you mean? He goes, you have this meter. And then he went exactly my little meter. And I just stared at him and I kind of got very teary eyed. I was very moved because he was listening so closely. And he was the first person in my entire life, a recording studio that said, sit down with me, let's work on it together. And so he and I worked together for hours, getting the pacing exactly right. And it is an incantation. There is a kind of lyrical, um, I don't know, uh, kind of sonic um, property to it that I'm trying, that, that you can listen to even sometimes without the images, which to answer your earlier question is why I, I pull away the images and just have black screens from time to time. Mm -hmm. Also at, our, um, at the exhibit in Paris where Julie invited me to join her in exhibition and we showed this for the first time, which was a tremendous gift um, by Marion Goodman. Uh, Julie also had the sound playing in one of the galleries with her paintings and prints. And I remember walking in as it was being installed before I even got to my installation and listening to the, that poem and the way I read it with Julie's work was also uh, a beautiful experience because uh, this poem, I wrote this poem for Julie in a way uh, to engage her abstraction. And so the words and the lyrics, uh, the meter, all of it, is very is is an exper experimentation in that extra, extraction. Uh, ex sorry, I'm tired. Abstraction, but uh, I wanted to see if I could turn English into an abstract form. Mm -hmm. Have you have you found um, working with images on this scale and in this way challenging? Because I was also wondering about oh my what God, are some you. of the things that maybe that you, you're still thinking about, even you know, well after sure. this work has been you know, installed mm. in Paris and now in New York. Mm, thank you. Um, I did not find it challenging in one bit. Mm. I felt like I finally found my home mm. and I'm starving for more. I'm just starving for it. I think, uh, you know, I didn't grow up around any artists of any kind, except mm. for the vernacular art that was, I was completely saturated with. I am a first generation great migration survivor. So that's a very special thing to be born to a family that has left a place and especially escaped a place and then be born into a place that is relatively more safe. You know, it's a very special experience I realized and probably why I relate so deeply to post-coloniality. Mm -hmm. um, but there weren't any classic trained musicians, classically trained artists, classically trained, I mean, critically trained writers around. And so when I, the only thing I even had near me was because my parents, I don't know how they did it. I had any book I ever wanted bought for me, given to me, talked to me about my whole life. And so I thought, well, I want to do this. I had a creative kind of imagination. But now that I think about it, and I've been thinking about it a lot in the last 15 years, 10 years, and especially once I just said, I'm going to make this for Julie. I'm just going to make it for, right? I wasn't intending on showing this. I didn't know. Like, it was just this beautiful commission that kept opening and opening and opening. And it was the exact language, the visual that I had been looking for for this project. I didn't know. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and I think, you know, I get sad about it because I think about all the kids who aren't exposed to art in the world, mm. who they don't even know. I remember the, that you can become an artist. I didn't know. I just simply did not know. I grew up um, academically in a very deprived situation. Los Angeles public school district was draconian. Mm. I mean, they beat us and, and the textbooks had horrible images of black people Horrible, thing, horrible things being done to Black people. The only images I saw of Black people were hanging from ropes, picking cotton, grabbing a floor. That's it. That's it, right? I mean, this is the 60s. I, I, it's interesting being a mother and, 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 and trying to explain this to my kid about why I'm the way that I am, you know? And so, yeah, I, I've had a studio now maybe about five years. And uh, I keep wanting more space. 
they're not big enough. However big I get, I was like, oh, I could do something bigger. So um, thank you for this question, Joan. I think you're seeing something that I don't often want to talk about, but I just think that I probably would have been a visual artist and mm -hmm. in, in addition to a writer and maybe not a writer at all if I had known that this was even a possibility, but we don't expose kids of color to art and mm. art practices. So, and the images you. and the 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 horrific images that you mentioned. It's like, what kind of community is that? Is that encouraging other students to build? Oh, and so, absolutely. And so, one of the um, the 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 words that you say in the work also struck me when you say the body was our archive. And sometimes we think about Alan Sekula, the body, and, uh, the body and the archive, which is very much about a certain kind of how do we empiricize selves into bodies where they can then be quantified and slotted in. And it also made me think about there's one image that shows your birth certificate. And for yeah. me, that was quite um, not a shock, but a little bit of a jolt because it records with uh, birth announcements, they record uh, name, but also weight and date. So the, the quantification is still there. And I felt that it was a really kind of um, very striking and very pertinent reminder about how is it that we can think about archives not as assembling databases so that more information can be extracted and used, but rather, can we think about archives as practices of congregation or assembly, which goes back to exactly. part of the liturgical function of your words that um, uh, you mentioned. And so I was wondering about, is this something you were thinking about, secular versus you know, non-secular time, that these are times that these are, this is a friction that we have to you know, come to grips with. And it, it felt like that was, I don't know, maybe I'm just reading too much into the work because I've seen it every day, but uh, <laughs> I was just wondering, um, I don't think you're reading too much into it. I think uh, I'm sitting here feeling very shy, actually. I think you're reading it so well that I feel, speaking of uh, seeing, I feel a little bit destabilized. You just, your questions are so rich, Joan, and so smart. Um, the body is the archive. I, and the secular, non-secular. I, I think the fact that you married those two observations together say so much about your own brilliant acuity. I mean, this non-secular secular struggle that has been going on since human beings, again, probably were upright. Um, I fall squarely in the, in the um, non-secular side. And I think that we threw the baby out with the bathwater. And uh, historically, when you know, their, their religion is deeply problematic and I don't practice any really. I was born Catholic and it's very dear to me, but it's because of the liturgical presence of Catholicism. I love to sing the mass, preferably in Latin. I love to hear it in Latin, right? Not because of what the words are saying. It has nothing to do with anything. <laughs> that the, what the words are saying is empire, 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 right? Regardless of what they say, we know that. Um, but it's more about the the sitting down together and singing together and listening together. And I think that's what you're also picking up in the piece. I was trying to figure out how, I mean, I think I'm always trying to figure out how can I get human beings to come back together into intimacy? Mm -hmm. How can we sit down together, be quiet together, love each other, listen to each other, listen to history, be engaged with history. And so I don't think that the archive is separate from the body. I think it's this exact same thing. You know, Marx talked about this all the time in the manifesto, how a weapon is an extension of the arm, right? Um, but a piece of paper is an extension of the arm too. And so you asked me about the photograph of my mother, which she wrote on the back. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't find that until, oh my God, had she died yet? I mean, it was so close around my mother's death. And I put it in at the last moment because I didn't know that she had written on the back of this photograph and it was in a frame. And when I took it out and I turned it over and I think it's in the, I think it's in, uh, I'm sorry, you guys, I'm sorry, Chloe. Yes, this one, uh, I thought Chloe had brought it. Yeah, 
So this was in the frame and I didn't see this until, you know, and I remember walking out of my studio at my mother's house where I was staying during the quarantine that I had built in the backyard and walking into my sister and showing it to my sister and both of us just standing there with this kind of resonance, resonant silence. Mm. And, and I think that uh, the archive contains this too. You know, this is very personal. And I also think that the culture of how we used to write each other as is present in this, the back of this photograph, how my mother just to my daughter, Robin, hope you will cherish this photo of me forever. We would never say that to each other now. We would say like, <laughs> we'd send an emoji, <laughs> you know? <laughs> But this is so, and but what we really mean is what my mother wrote on the back of this photograph, often. I mean, I guess what I'm saying is, I think I lament sometimes it feels like we've forgotten how to love each other mm. and we've forgotten how to care for each other. And so there's something about the non-secular, secular crossroad, cro cross with the body and the archive or the body and, and material evidence that I think this installation meets at that crossroad and says all of the above, don't choose one. Please don't choose one. Um, yeah, a, a demand, I, I think it's an invitation for simultaneity, I mm. guess. Or, or the capacity, to, I guess like the capacity to uh, be able to receive contradiction because um, the other, you know, there's a part also in the work where you say, I don't want to be found. It's almost like a section divider in the work. And it, that was yes. very, very, for me, that was um, also very profound in thinking about how is it that the archive or all of these photographs, it's not, in a, it's, it's not just a kind of a, a blatant act of disclosure, that there is also an understanding that if you are to, if you have the privilege to look at them, you also have the obligation not to just take them for granted. And I, 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 yeah, I was just wondering what you um, or how you came to sort of separate or insert this particular phrase. I don't want to be found because they were standalone on the blank screen, and I, I was just really uh, very moved by that. Joan, wow. Okay, so let's back up a bit. The first thing you said about if you have the privilege to look upon these photographs, that's how I felt. I felt I inherited an incredible gift. And I took care of this archive for 25 years. And the few times I took it out, when I first took it out, I was very young, I was in my thirties. And I remember going to Kinko's to do a color copy. Color copiers had just come out, it was all the rage. <laughs> and I went to go color copy a few so that I could work with them without damaging the photographs. At least I was mature enough to know that much. But I remember at the Kinko's counter, this man who was sitting next to me picked up the original photographs and was like, wow. And mm. the feeling in my body was one of pure attack, rage. Like, I was like, please don't touch them. Please put them down. Yeah. But what I felt inside was like lion, like, Rah! right? Um, because I feel like they're so, I, I feel like they're so special. The novelist Dana Johnson um, from Los Angeles, whose work is incredible, also African-American, also born in South Central, just said to me, Robin, I only have two photographs from my entire family, only two. And I have hundreds, you know. I know for a lot of people who grew up in certain kinds of families or around certain kinds of material culture, you know, 600, 500, which is what I have, I think, now, um, is small. I know their photographic collections that are 10,000, 20,000. The Getty has 150,000 images in one, you know, I get it. But for, for people who were stolen and, and, you know, all of that, to be able to have any image and, and the images are like this of my brother who just passed away holding me on our front lawn in Compton, mm -hmm. you know, and then to be able to say the line for this, pay, uh, for this image, uh, the voiceover is just be with me here mm -hmm. on this page, yeah. you know, to try to, to say to the reader, we don't have to let each other go or the viewer, we don't have to stop holding each other. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a way in which this is, this is, you know, there are lovers, there are haters. I'm a lover. And, and, and these past few years, especially, but the history of humanity keeps reminding us of that divide. 
And I also really wanted to love the viewer, especially after the last four years. I wanted the viewer to do exactly what my brother and I are doing there. Yes, exactly. Thank you, Chloe. And here, you know, mm -hmm. we used to we used to know how to be near each other. You know, there are all these studies coming out now about profound social isolation that everyone's exhibiting and feeling. Mm -hmm. And I didn't grow up that way. I grew up being kissed hundred times a day mm -hmm. by my relatives. And for me, that's history. Like people think when I talk about this, that I'm waxing nostalgic. I'm not at all. I'm talking about how history over time has taught us to abandon each other. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we can, I can, I could reframe this and switch codes and talk about this in terms of allyship, if you like, right. And the lack of, mm -hmm. right the abandonment that political parties do with each other, the ways in which we abandon each other in our politics. I could put it in some very fancy uh, critical language. I choose not to, mostly because what for, and, and also this is much, this, it's too urgent and it's too important to play games with language. Mm -hmm. What I really want to say is what has happened to us? Mm -hmm. how, did we, how did we get so far away from this, you know? What, what happened to um, our intelligence? Mm -hmm. What happened, you know? I hope I'm answering your question, Joan. I no, I, no, I just thinking about the, how the, you know, the capacity to emote has been suppressed in the name of meritocracy. So yeah. what, what, we, what we call professional basically means get rid of all your affects, you know, only adopt that which is the most bland or anodyne and to right. not- Exactly. Not be able to express fear or anxiety or joy or uh, disappointment or vulnerability that I think that also, you know, when just hearing you talk, it, you're also making a case for how the ability to not and it's not just expression. It's also how is it to, to receive and also convey emotion is itself a survival skill that is being actively repressed Absolutely. in the name of some kind of corporatist, you know, um, I don't know, quasi right. you know, liberal, uh, you know, regime that says, oh, you have to, you know, dress in a certain way to be taken seriously. Right? How is it that the idea to be taken seriously has now been so narrow that it has basically excluded everything that makes you know, lives meaningful? Right? So Absolutely. I actually think it goes back uh, much further than that uh, to Descartes and the Cartesian split of the body and the mind. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about that a lot when I made intimacy. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and wrote the poem for Julie too. That's why I keep talking about the reader because Julie was the reader, right? Mm -hmm. The first thing I did was write this poem and send it to her. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why I keep talking about the reader, but I think it's a deeper, it has a, lo a more prolonged history of uh, the, the kind of invention of rationality and the enlightenment, what that meant. The enlightenment was beautiful in a lot of ways. It was also very dangerous. I mean, there's no coincidence that the enlightenment and colonialism kind of tap dance yeah. into history at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really so clever to deal, <laughs> kidnap, murder, maim, whole countries of people and then say, don't cry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> don't, don't, don't be sad. What, what, you're sad? Come on, come on. Right. It's or like get over it. Right. Yeah. Or, you know, but, 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 but deeply, I mean, just think about that. You, you drop bombs on whatever mm -hmm. <laughs> it happens everywhere. Yeah. And then you say to the survivors, don't cry, you know, go to work, whatever. And so I, it's really hard to be a black woman poet writing about photographs that she inherited from her grandmother and be taken seriously. That is why this took so much time. Right. Mm -hmm. And to also be talking about what I'm talking about, which is ultimately embodiment. Yes. Right. Yes. And not be dismissed as some sentimental doily crocheting, <laughs> you know, pink pastel knitting girl. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. It's really hard. This image, for example, to show how dark and strong and iron and uh, powerful it is to hold on to each other. Not many people can do it. You know, we, we talk a good deal. We talk a great deal, but uh, about, you know, how, where we are as being this great moment in history. I'm not talking about the oppressive side. I mean, 
the other side, the kind of evolutionary development side. But, you know, very few of us know how to stay close to each other or have somebody stay close to us. Very few of us know how to actually do intimacy. Mm-hmm. I mean, political intimacy, intimacy, historical intimacy, personal intimacy, uh, platonic intimacy, sexual intimacy, all of it, all of it. And, and for me, when I say the body is the archive, the body records all of this. You know, I know it's a, a great book that people are reading right now called The Body Remembers. The body records all of this. Mm-hmm. And I'm trying to suggest in this piece that the body also records history, but not just for centuries, but millennia after millennia after millennia. You know, our cells are so intelligent. I did so much mm-hmm. reading. I'm so, I was so grateful to hear you talk about Papua New Guinea and the migrations there. I did so much reading both on the history of the cell it was very important to me. I am like ready for my degree in biology and, and on the history of human migrations just to write this poem for Julie and then make this piece because that's what I was trying to say. This is nothing new. You know, we've been doing this for so long mm-hmm. and, and to try to say, you know, when will we, when will we get it right? When mm-hmm. will we get it right? Mm-hmm. And I was also thinking maybe that is this work also a way for a different kind of embodiment? Because one of the things that also was very singular to me is that, so we're watching a work that art historians would call video or film, but the the viewing experience is very not dissimilar to actually seeing and holding snapshots. That's yes. very difficult to do with, uh, yes. with screen-based media. Yeah, and I was wondering if that was an experience that you wanted to give to your audiences. Absolutely, and it speaks back, thank you. It speaks back uh, uh, to the question you asked earlier about sound, right? Part of the role that silence plays in this piece is to, uh, kind of seduce and manipulate the reader into that exact description you just said about the viewer. If it was just nonstop sound, it wouldn't work. It wouldn't work. Silence has a huge presence in this piece. You know, James Baldwin said, silence is a language black people speak fluently, you know, and I absolutely wanted the reader to feel, or the viewer, I'm sorry, I keep saying reader, you guys, I wrote this as a poem first. And, you know, people always keep asking me, oh, how did you write these words for the photograph? I'm like, no, I wrote, I, I wrote the photographs for the words. <laughs> you know, the, wor- the photographs came second and then the projection came third. So that's why I'm talking about it in this way. Um, but I absolutely wanted the, the darkness of the installation. That's why I wanted it to be an installation too, is that suddenly, you know, you're just a, a person by yourself looking at something the way you are when you uh, look at photographs. And at the end of the installation is the sound of pages turning um, because I wanted the viewer to have that experience that this is just you and these photographs and an album, and hello, and how are you? I know the world's not okay. Here we are, look at this, right? You can't get readers, you can't get viewers to go into that place by constantly talking. Mm -hmm. You have to use silence as a a musical instrument too. Mm -hmm. At least I couldn't get them to do it. And it's, it's also, it also sounded, it for me, it also sounded that silence was an opportunity to reject occupation, which seems to mm-hmm. get, I, I'm trained in tradition, uh, earlier Asian art. And so for us, the void or emptiness is as, in some ways, it is more important. Negative space is more important than the space that you fill up. And it struck me that this is, the work is doing something very similar as well. It's rejecting yes. this idea that, the author's and and the author's intention must colonize the work. Yes, absolutely, Joan. I mean, that's a very uh, exquisite way to uh, articulate what I've been trying to say for the last however many minutes we've been talking. Yeah, and, you know, Kevin Kwashi has this brilliant book about quiet, right? Quiet as an aesthetic. And I think partly why poetry 
and the lyric and and lyrical sounds mean so much to me is that you know the silence within it also what you can do it's it's music and um i think when when people are unbeknownly forced into quiet and silence there's a kind of release that happens. I know I sound like I'm a yoga teacher. That's not what I'm trying to do here. I'm trying to talk about blackness actually, right? But that the reason why the language doesn't exist is because uh, our the ways in which we think about blackness are so deeply, deeply skewed and stupid, right? That in fact, this piece for Julie was a, a, a huge release for me um, mm -hmm. as an artist, because I finally found a way to do exactly that for me, was to talk about this history without the uh, frame of American time around it. Mm -hmm. And in fact, without the frame of Western time around it at all. This, this, this installation has nothing to do with Occidentalism, nothing at all, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and, and sometimes that pisses people off because <laughs> they expected my my next work to be more rage, like voyage, you know, more let me tell you about what's wrong with the Western canon. And that's not this project at all. No, you you're know? not, you're not a content provider. I'm sorry. It's, it's, you know, it's, you know, I feel, you know, this work and the poetry is also trying, for me, it was also trying to say, you know, that we're looking, trying to look at a time when these colonial definitions of blackness just are completely irrelevant. Exactly. So, and then, and then if that, exactly, Joan, thank you. And then if that's the case, what do you do as a viewer? Mm -hmm. And that's the experience of intimacy mm -hmm. that I'm trying to evoke. It's like, it's okay. Mm -hmm. And after all that is said and done, where are you sitting now? If I have, and I hope I have been successful in dismantling that project in the viewer psyche quietly, mm -hmm. right? It, it's really difficult. And all of this was consciously done. Like, how can I get to take off all these like hundreds of years and millennia of armor from our psyches? How can I get there with the viewer with something as modern as photographs? Mm -hmm. How do I do it? How do I use them? And the answer was the sound mm -hmm. and, 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 and language that, I mean, and to do it with the colonizer's language too, a language of uh, colonization. And, and Creolismo, I mean, how do how do you make English? I talk about this all the time. How do you turn English into an anti-colonial instrument? Mm -hmm. You know, it's, and, and in this case, an abstract one. And, you know, because of Julie Moretti, you know, the answer was abstraction. It was abstraction mm -hmm. that you can, I can use English abstractly. I can turn English into an abstract art. As Julie and I talked about, I can make marks with English. I can make abstract marks with English, you can do it. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know that until I wrote this piece for Julian. I made this piece for Julian. And it's, it's been a huge watershed moment for me where you know I had planned to make and am planning to make other installations and a longer film perhaps mm -hmm. um, when I get some more time. But it's just such a delicious moment. Also, you, you guys, I carried this archive around for 25 years. And the fact, I mean, I have moved so many times as most people did from college to college, graduate school and all that. And the fact that these photographs didn't get lost compared when you think about all the things, when I think about all the things that did get lost, it's, uh, it's monumental. And so the fact that these photographs have been A, digitized so well, and now that the archive is safe, I'm kind of floating around most of the time. I didn't realize I was carrying, it was a delicious, exquisite weight but it was a wait, you know, because this, this could have been lost so easily. And it was a critical wait for you. So um, again, as you know, someone who is the descendant of people who had to flee their homes at very short notice. Uh, exactly. So one of, the, one of the things my grandparents always said is, um, what are the three things you would take with you? And always yes. having that in your head wherever yes. you go, because you don't yes. know when you're going to be forced out of your home or exactly. burned down or, and the fact that you, Took, you had these photographs. I mean, again, so in, you know, in some ways, you are also reaffirming how is it that these photographs are absolutely essential to your survival. Yes, Joan, I'm so happy you talked about your family. It was also really important to me, considering the history 
of humanity and our propensity for war. Uh, there's only been one year in the last, I think it's 4,000 years where there wasn't a war on the planet. Only once in several millennia. And I absolutely had so many diasporas, so many histories in mind when I made this uh, project. I wanted everyone who saw this to be able to enter into it, right? To say, well, yeah, just like what you just said, my grandparents used to say this. And also during, when I was finishing this piece, uh, Julie and I, I was in Los Angeles, Julie was here in New York and we were talking almost every day and we were watching the elections. And when it looked like Trump was going to win, uh, Julie kept texting me. We were just having such a, you know, we're mothers, we have huge families. How are we going to protect everybody when we're so spread out? Mm -hmm. And I'm, I will never forget it. Julie texted me. I just don't want to be the last person at the border. Mm -hmm. And that line, I'm sure I will write about that at some point. Because mm -hmm. what I thought about that and continued, I think about it almost every day because I don't want to be the last person at the border. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure we're safe. And I don't know if we ever will be. You know, right? That's the great thing about the title of my book, but also the great thing in Buddhism, right? Especially Tibetan Buddhism, there is no such thing as safety. There is no floor, right? And that's also why, why that floating through the fades and the photographs and the video, I wanted that floorlessness to be an experience that I gave to the viewer, but at the same time, right? So take the floor out completely from under their feet, but but give them something to not feel so afraid mm. that's actually floorlessness is actually a really honest place to be mm. right um but yeah so i wanted i wanted i wanted people all over the world to be able to look at this and go yeah in the case this is my aunt alice yes that woman looks like you know or the children behind in the spade yes before we left that our village, that's how we used to dress. And then we assimilated into this new city. And so then we started wearing blue cardigans and headbands, right? That kind of stuff. That is a story of that, that's a story of human migrations everywhere. Um, and I also, in 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 doing that, was hoping to make a statement that, you know, major. Um, narrative cultures have been asking us to identify with the hero for, again, millennia. We're supposed to identify with Odysseus. We're supposed to identify with Achilles. We're supposed to identify with Paul fucking Revere. We're supposed to identify with, you know, it just keeps going on and on. White men, white men, on a horse, Napoleon, blah, 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 blah. And you, any story that we were, that was forced out our throats, we were supposed to identify. And guess what? We did. We did that kind of elasticity of code switching all the time. We did it. And so I wanted to make a piece that required in a very, or invited, not required, but maybe it required to, invited the viewer to say, you are this person. It doesn't matter. Can't you step into these shoes too? For once, can't you step out of your kind of cultural narcissism and step into the bodies of others and, and understand that this woman in this photograph is my Achilles, is my, uh, you know, Odysseus, this, this woman before you, my aunt, right? Extraordinary woman, you'll never know about her, never knew about her, never, right? But you can't imagine the heroic limps she went to for our survival, right? And I want, so I wanted that to be the case, but I also wanted, people to think about the people in their families too, like your grandmother, like your great-great-grandmother, like somebody's uncle, like all of these people just did extraordinary things. The last century was horrible. I mean, it was just horrible, you know, from beginning to end. And somehow with all the wars all over the world and the project of uh, uh, colonialism and everything else, right? Somehow we're still here. And I'll be damned if I'm not going to celebrate that. Mm -hmm. I'll be damned. I think uh, this is the perfect note to invite um, our uh, lovely audience to contribute to this 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 community of questions. I don't know if you can call questions forming a community, but I I don't know. I've always found it useful. So. I love that that community of inquiry. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Thank you for listening to us. 
Thank you. Wow, that was incredible. Thank you so much, Joan. And thank you, Robin, for that just brilliant and generous dialogue. Um, we do have a few questions from the audience. And so I'm going to turn it over to Lynn first. Lynn, feel free to ask. And if anyone else has a question, please feel free to raise your hand or put it in the chat and we'll go to you. Oh, Lynn, Hi, I think you're mute. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Hi, Lynn. Hi. Hi, Joan. And hi, hi. Rob. Th this has been so great. And I'm, I hope I can phrase my question because I'm overwhelmed mm -hmm. uh, emotionally and intellectually. And this was just an incredible exchange. So do you know if there's any type of um, fruitful psychological studies going on about these issues you're discussing because like, mm -hmm. you know, fake nostalgia and, you know, uh, sadism toward the other. And are there, are there bodies of research understanding why this happens in the psychological profile so that possibly it could be looked at that way? Oh, it's such a great question. So I don't know the answer to your question because I am a modernist when it comes to theory. I'm still back a century. I haven't, I don't, I don't know. I, I, I am. What, well, you're going to know why now. So the, the, one of the books that I carry with me at all time, here's I'm dating myself, but I'm very proud of it, is I read a lot of Marie-Louise Bonfant, who was Jung's both uh, uh, analysis but, and disciple, but then became a, a great psychoanalyst herself. Um, and the book I carry with me, well, two I carry with me at all times is Projection and Recollection right? Because she's talking about Jung's idea of projection, how we're so, we, you know, we're so quick to demonize everything. We, we demonize projection, right? And say, you know, stop it. But this book is about, oh, but projection is such a gift. And I use this book a lot to make this piece that we just were mm. talking about, you know, speaking of, like, it's a projection, right? Uh, literally in a gallery, but it's also about <laughs> It's also playing with intentionally. I played with um, human the human propensity to project ourselves onto each other. You know, as I told my therapist years and years ago, it's like, oh God, ninety nine percent of the time I'm projecting, aren't I? And she just laughed hysterically. It's like, yes, we're never ever really seeing each other clearly. Rarely, it's always like you know what we think and believe. So anyway, and I'm still a big, huge, huge reader of, um, you know, all of that, like Franz Fanon, decolonizing the mind, all of that work and post-coloniality. I'm still so enamored with um, so much work that was done that I haven't quite caught up to the people who are like been working the last five or 10 years. Joan is probably your your money ticket right here. Oh no, no, um, psychology yeah. is a little. It's a little bit beyond me. I have to say. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. but I know the work is being done. But you know the thing about that. Oh, God, I'm going to get myself like tarred and feathered by the the this particular community. The thing about that is so much of their work go back to these sources, right? So, exactly. So I read the sources. I often. I'm always looking for the sources because ultimately that's where the fire is for me. Thank you. It's a great question, Lynn. Thank you. I wish I had a better answer for you, but I don't. I'm sorry. Thank you so much for that question, Lynn. Um, I know, right? Yeah, that was that was so great. Um, I'm going to pass it over to SL who has their hand Simon, up. Simon, yes. Hi, Simon. Hi. Hi. Hi, Robin. Hi. Jill. Hi, darling. Um, I'm just... I, I feel like the two of you together is really the perfect combo. I just love it. <laughs> and, I feel so too. Robin, I, I, I hope to see you in LA more. <laughs> <laughs> oh, actually, anyway. oh, actually, Simon, I'm, I'm doing a reading in LA at Caltech on May 24th or 23rd, 23rd. I'll put I, if, in, if you're on Instagram, I'll put it up. I'm going to put it up soon. I will, I will go very, very uh, happily. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I want to really go back to this uh, idea that Joan proposes, which you answer so well, about obligation. Yeah. You know, this idea of being able to, this idea of um, 
if you have the privilege to see something, then you have the obligation not to take that intimacy for granted. Yes. Right? So this is something that I I say to my students all the time about yes. about intimacy. Yes. And that is, and I always pose it as a question, and I always pose it as a question that cannot really be answered, especially not on the moment in the moment that I pose it. And that is, I understand that you have these feelings of intimacy, and it's very moving and galvanizing. But imagine, just imagine, what it would be like for you to really take responsibility for your intimacy. Yes. So that's the question that I asked them. Yes. And to me, um, I, I just want to, I mean, I have some theoretical things I can say, but I just want to uh, hear you talk about obligation, responsibility in relationship to intimacy a little bit. My God, thank you. How beautiful. Um, I mean, the thing about talking about all this, you guys, it's like, I think I said earlier, is that, you know, you, people just, it's just so easy to dismiss us. It's so easy to dismiss us and to render us invisible for so many reasons, so many reasons, right? So I, I feel very tentative and shy about the things I've said today, but it's really what I feel. So fuck it. Okay. Um, I love this thing you say, you know, Toni Morrison talks about freedom as an obligation, right? Everyone wants to get free, but no, like how many people actually want to take on what it means to be free actually. Um, and it, it's kind of related to what you're saying, you know, we want the intimacy, but do we actually want, um, and by this, I mean, intimacy with history, right? We want to be the authors and we should, we want to engage it and correct it and we should. And all of those things, um, you know, I tell my daughter partly why I, I've, I've hit this new level of saturation in terms of my tolerance for hate and especially my tolerance for passive aggressive hate, right? I, I just can't. And I told her, I was like, you know, I go outside. It used to be I go outside and 20 times a day, somebody says something idiotic, sexist, racist, homophobic, whatever to me. And it stays with me. I'm realizing how oversaturated I am with it all, you know? And now it comes in before I even get on my bed, it's already there on my phone <laughs> in the form of email and whatnot. And so what I'm really thinking about these days, I know I'm not answering your question, Simon, I'm so sorry, but what I'm really thinking about these days is, and, and maybe this is the answer, how is it that we keep each other in a place of feeling profoundly safe and I'm talking about diasporic peoples especially like how do we use art use our work use our lives you know to 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 stop doing so much intellectual harm how, how do we like what are we doing do we even think about the words we say to each other before they, we blurt them out of our miles, mouths or put them in a text message but also, I was talking to a friend yesterday, you know, thinking, you know, how you get older, you start to realize you're just history and nothing else. Like the individual doesn't exist. I'm not really real. I'm just a piece of history moving around. And I've been thinking about that in so many ways. And one of the ways I've been thinking about it is I grew up at a time where there was a moral obligation to each other that was as real as this computer I'm talking on, right? I was expected, like everyone around me, to volunteer somewhere. Since I was a young child, what, what are you doing? What's your volunteer work, right? Just understood that we were all volunteering and we all were, right? Understood that, Simon, if you sent a note to me or my mother saying, do you have a cup of milk? That my mother would send a gallon. Understood. Just normal. Understood that I would be covered with kisses in the morning. Regardless, you know, or no one's going to go to sleep at night angry, just all of these ways in which um, I didn't know I was being cared for and being taught a political skill of survival, political skills of survival, you know, to be kissed every day. I didn't realize people that everybody wasn't being kissed every day. 
I didn't as a child. And now I do know, you know, it's why I've changed my language completely. Simon, if you and I ever have uh, tea, you'll see, I'll go, hello, honey. Hi, darling. How are you, sweetheart? Right? Not because I'm Southern, not only because of that, but because there's so much hatred. Every single minute in the in my day, there is so much hatred that I'm just trying to do some like, you know, cut it all away. Um, and so, with regard to intimacy um, and the obligation of it, we're not going to get through anything that's happening alone. You know, I, I just don't believe that. And I was raised in a deeply, deeply um, strident way. To, to understand that, you know, so what if you get to heaven? If you're not taking everybody with you, you're, you're worthless. It's worthless, you know? And so what if you become some kind of success? Who cares? Like, did you go, you know, volunteer at the hospital? So I don't know if I'm answering your question, but that's, that's where your question led me. Simon, that was an amazing question. And Robin, it was. That was an incredible answer. Thank you so much. We have two more questions. Uh, the sure. next one is going to be from Adriana. Adriana, I'll give you the chance to unmute. Hi, I think I'm unmuted now. Hi, Robin. Hi. I just I'm... realized who that was. I my glasses, these aren't my best glasses for seeing. Hi, darling. Not, Adriana not and I ever... were classmates years ago. We were not, and these glasses aren't my best either. I've got progressive now, so I could look at you like this. But um, I just wanted to say I'm I'm so edified by your words, and I have been consistently, as I've read your words, thinking of how quenching they are mm. for me. And mm. I'm I'm I cannot wait to see this installation, but to hear you say how thirsty or how how starving you were for more, having had this opportunity just um, kind of like tickled me in a way to maybe just ask like what, so you have this body of work that you found that you responded to and there's an intimacy and there's a um, response to a friend. Um, and what, so in this idea of starving for opportunities like this, have you considered what you would want to look at next or is it is there a format is there a material is there um is there a texture to it or do sure. you know yeah um i want to make more installations for sure uh there's a second book i'm writing with the colored photographs from my grandmother's archive and with white pages because technicolor those photographs are sexy y'all they're so sexy just the color i don't even care what they're doing Technicolor, man, I, this is where I do wax nostalgic. The 70s were fantastic. I'm sorry, I don't care what anybody says. I was there, polyester, technicolor, heaven, okay? And so I, I really wanna make a book that's an homage to uh, that and, and, and then also really wanna make more installations. I just, you guys, you know, you know, you know how you find something, you're like, oh my God, that's it, that's it. It's like, I remember when I was in graduate school at Harvard, I had to write an essay on Kant. I took a whole class in Kant and aesthetics. Why? Why did I do that? I don't know, but I did it. And I had to write an essay on Kant. And I remember walking across Harvard Yard crying, not because of anything, except that I felt such pain about the form. I was like, an academic essay, that's not what I want to do with Kant's need for darkness. <laughs> that's not what I want to do. And it took me so long to, to find art was like, that's what I want to do. In fact, Adriana, you guys saw the first, the beginnings of this project. Damn, Adriana, it's 20 something years ago when I think about it, right? When I was just like, I have these photographs, you know, I don't know what I'm doing. And I just put them all up in my studio at Bard and just, you know, people would come in. I would try different things, but mostly it was because of, that's what I was trying to talk about, a lack of exposure. I just didn't have any exposure. When I, I will never forget when Spike Lee's first film came out. Uh, She's Gotta Have It. And it came to my undergrad. And they introduced him. He came. And they were like, he went to NYU film school. And I looked at my friend next to me. And I went, you can go to film school? I didn't know there was a film school. I, I didn't know that. Right? That was in the 80s. So, you know, this whole idea, the, the ways in which we talk about reparations, right? 
it's just, you know, art is a part of reparations. I just was not exposed. And now that I have spent the last several decades re-educating myself about the art world, I just want more and more and more and more and more and more. And one thing that I definitely realized I needed a few years ago, about five years ago, is that I needed a studio. I didn't know. I didn't know you could say, I need a studio. <laughs> or, you know, prioritize, prioritize having a studio over whatever other dumb shit I was prioritizing, right? Um, so yeah, that's where I see that going. And I have a couple other art projects that have nothing to do with my grandmother's archive and just ideas. I remember looking at your work, Adriana, it was actually very uh, formative for me to be at Bard that summer because you guys were so fucking exciting and your work was so dynamic. And I was like, I didn't know you could do that. I mean, that's, that's kind of like the story of my life, both as a woman in patriarchy and as a black person in America. It's, it's this, or growing up, you know, working class. I just constantly going, I, I didn't know you could do that. You could do that? I didn't know. And, and you know, and that, and now that I know, I, I, look the fuck out. I'm starving and I'm hungry and I'm going for it. Full, full throttle, full throttle. Love yeah. it, love it, go for it. Thank you, thank you. It means a lot to me coming from you. Thank you. And thanks for the question. Yeah, Adriana, that was an amazing question. Thank you so much. Uh, the last question today is going to be from Bong H. Bowie, our publisher and artistic director at The Rail. Fantastic. I'm honored. Hi, Robin. Hi, Joe. Hi, darling. Wow, that was really amazing. I was distracted by three brief phone call, which I told, can I just call you back? <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's uh, it's it's so rich and honest and generous, and when you both were talking about silence and void, negative space, and that's certainly one of the most important thing in poetry. Yeah, space that exists between words, and I remember I just can't help it because the other day the pre-check we talked about Ma Check Dong, thought that was a librarian. I'm now halfway through a immersive biography of Joseph Stalin by Stephen mm. Hawking. It's called Waiting for Hitler. Mm. So intense. Mm. And it reminds me so much about my upbringing in Vietnam too. I won't mm -hmm. go into it, but I just want to share a story that when Boris Pasternak, uh, during the three days, you know, I don't know, maybe three or four day long um, of the Soviet Writers' Congress during the, the Moscow trial, 37, when each day everyone was forced to express their profuse thanks to, you know, brothers, father Stalin for the new model of truth, you know. You know. Mm -hmm. Pasternak was in complete total silence the mm -hmm. entire time, and he was standing not far from Andrei Zadanov, the Stalinist killer, mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. off stage and on the very last day Pasternak's friend all of them insisted that since he wouldn't be arrested he couldn't be killed because he's so famous can you say something Boris that when they go when they die they can live by you know so mm -hmm. Pasternak accept the very last day he he walks up onto the stage and gives the number as you guys remember he was famous for having translated Shakespeare and other author in Russia, mm -hmm. you know, in Russia. Yeah. So, yeah. so when he stepped up, all he did was to get the number Sonnet 30, he say. <laughs> so, <laughs> Sonnet 30, and then the 2000 writers, all of them stood wow. up, you know, and wow. they recited. Remember the first two, two line of that, um, Sonnet 30, went to the sections of sweet, silent thought. Totally. I sum up remembrance of things past. Yes. So powerful, you know? So powerful. So powerful. Yes. Uh, okay. So Amazing. I know. So, 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 so what is my question? <laughs> <laughs> my question is, <laughs> don't get distracted. You got excited here. You <laughs> make me feel like a dry sponge, Robin. What did you say? You make me feel like a dry sponge. Oh. 
I'm Why? sucking up everything. Hello. Oh. <laughs> um, oh. No, the the you your collaboration with with Julie. It's interesting to see this photograph here, which mm. I can't help but to think of the idea. You know, palimpsests consolidation. Yes. Yeah. Palimpsest consolidation or form of consolidation. Yes. It's really a form that need to be created by interaction of much hidden alchemical processes, you know, yes. which, which generate a kind of a synaptic efficacy yes. over a very lifetime, over yeah. time, yeah. almost like a form of reincarnation, you can Absolutely. say. Absolutely. Uh, so this sort of consolidation permits idle memories to be temporarily overridden, yeah. without being forgotten. Mm -hmm you know, unseen mm -hmm. memory previously mm -hmm. uh, used in short-term memory in some way, you know, so it fluctuates that far. Uh, and, and I know that Julie kind of does the same, Victorian her work. There's a lot yes. of layer to create that palimpsest. That's right. So have you That's guys right. talked about that at all? Or was it- Well, I'm sitting here smiling so beautifully because words that we continually return to, palimpsest, erasure, time, intimacy, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. uh, and the works that we were sending each other were historical instances of uh, erasures. Um, yeah, but I should have said that, we, and Julie and I don't talk about this enough and we should do a whole talk about it, is that this project began where I was writing this poem for her to make monotypes from. Mm. And uh, Julie did this brilliant show in London with monotypes at White Cube, I think I'm not mistaken. And she sent me PDFs of them. And Julie and I have been friends for, we've known each other for 30 years. We've been close friends for a few to several years now. But uh, so when I saw the monotypes, I said, my God, they're so intimate, right? And she kind of gave me this giggle that was like, Oh my God, you see me, <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, because, and, and, and I had never studied monotypes in any real way before this project. And so I went on this huge deep dive on the history of monotypes and Adriana, this also answers your question. I also, when I wrote this poem for Judah, I actually wrote her a whole book. This is just one little section of the whole book that will come out at some point when I get around to editing it again. Um, and the first section, which is about, I don't know, 80 pages is about, it's a long poem about the history, erasure of the history of the monotype, right? And just like photography, the monotype just confesses history. It just does, you know? And uh, because I thought I was writing for, the, for Julie to make monotypes, I was trying to meet her intimately in that aesthetic of the monotype, like get in, get out. You know, monotypes, you get one chance and maybe you yeah. can pull another ghost, that's it. And so I wanted the words to function that way. Like, like you have, and you have to be very, her body, your body, have to, you have to be very close to the plate, to all of that. And so the layering that he's known for couldn't necessarily occur so I thought but of course Maretu being Maretu he somehow pulled it off and so that was also there how can I make and, and the Degas monotype show really moved her and and Degas used to live in New Orleans I don't know if you guys know this yep. so Degas has a whole <laughs> black history that nobody talks about and um I just really wanted to make it the layering be a layering of silence, mm -hmm. right? A lot of different silences that if you're open, you can hear them. And, or more importantly, if I open you, mm -hmm. you can hear them. Mm -hmm. And all of this was like, how do I do it? How do I do it? Um, and the poem, the words, and the sound is what I came up with. I hope it works. I hope you go see it, Vong. It's, uh, you know, in, 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 I think, all artistic mediums, that whole less is more aesthetic, mm -hmm. I live by it. And so, you know, I wrote pages upon pages upon pages of this project 
of this poem for Julie before I then made the installation. And then it was just a matter of pulling back. So for example, there's a image where the only sound that goes along with it is yes, just the word yes, right? Mm -hmm. And the image of the, uh, two women and a man and they're drinking beer in the back of a house. And, and for some reason, the other thing that just fascinates me is how comfortable these people were with the camera. They're just so comfortable. And maybe that's because who the shooter is. I don't know what the hell is going on in these images half the time. I really don't. And I don't want to pretend that I know. Um, and so, you know, I found this uh, erasure. It's probably going to be a book cover of Mount Rushmore before it was carved into Mount Rushmore. It's just the plain mm -hmm. face. And Julie and I just laughed at it. You know, it was like, this is exactly what our work is, you know? And I think she and I, in our shared histories, we met in graduate school. She was at RISD, I was at the Div School. I saw her graduate show, <laughs> you know, like there's this understanding that time and our bodies moving through time, speaking of the archive, Joan, time is the archive. Our bodies moving through time is, is so densely complicated yeah. and, and, and so deeply intimate and tender and like dark. And I mean dark in the most, in the strongest, ugh, like iron dark, like the core of the earth. Mm -hmm. That, that's what, that's what I am trying to do with my work. And I think Julie is too. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think there's like uh, Hannah Arendt once say, freedom is politics, which belong to the body of action. Freedom. Oh, absolutely. Action. Uh, I, I use one of her, I use an epigraph in the essay I'm writing about this project that's called Wake. Uh, and I can't quote it verbatim, but it's something like, this book was written with the idea that both progress, oh, I can't do it justice, but basically progress and despair are two sides of the same coin and neither are appropriate to this project. Yeah. Hence, yeah. intimacy and directness yes. <laughs> is a form of aesthetic morality in my view. Yes, yes, exactly. Exactly. Well, thank you so much, Jesus. Oh, I, I'm honored. I I'm can't honored. wait to hear the whole thing again. Um, <laughs> I'm honored. Good to see thank you. you. <laughs> Back thank to you, you Chloe. Thank, thank you Fong. so much for that question, Fong. That was amazing. Um, and thank you again, Robin and Joan, for this conversation. Oh, of course. We have a tradition at the rail of ending our community events with a reading. And so I'm so pleased that Robin is going to read a poem to close oh. us. Thank you. Uh, the poem I'm going to read isn't in the book or the installation, but I think it does speak to my uh, collaboration with Julie and I think kind of the place from which I'm standing when I think about photography in this vaster history of time. Um, it's called uh, Self-Portrait as the Boot Black in Daguerre's Boulevard de Temple. And it's an erasure of Grant Allen's novel, um, Recall to Life, which is one of the first Victorian novels that has, this. It's, it's a crazy, silly novel, but it has a very strong uh, presence of uh, photography and the, uh, the ways in which photography change our, our worlds in it. And so in reading the novel, as always, again, with erasures, I, I have a very strong erasure practice, um, both visual and uh, lyrical. Uh, I kept seeing these words, like Joan, when you asked that question about the paper, right? It's broken, it's pierced, it's torn. I kept seeing words in the novel that for me had nothing to do with what the novel was trying to say, or which is to say, I often think that artists and photographers especially are wholly unconscious of some of the things we create. And so I erased the novel and this is it. Self-Portrait as the Boot Black in Daguerre's Boulevard de Temple. Uh, I don't believe I thought or gave names in any known language. I spoke of myself always in the third person. What led up to it, I hadn't the faintest idea. I only knew the event itself took place. Constant discrepancies, to throw them off, I laughed, talked, 
all games and amusements to escape from the burden of my own internal history. But I was there trying for once to see you, longed so to see you. I might meet you in the street, a bicycle leaning up against the wall by the window, rendered laws of my country played before my face, historical, two-souled, forgotten, unknown freaks of memory, the matter of debts, the violent death of a near relation, and all landing at the faintest conception, dark, blue, and then. All I can remember is when I saw you. It was you or anyone else. The shot seemed to end all. It belongs to the new world. The present all entangled, unable to move. Everything turned around and looked at you. Thank you. Wow. wow. Robin, that was amazing. Thank you so much for reading today. And thank you so much for this conversation. This has been just so extraordinary and wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, uh, thank you so much as well to the team at Marion Goodman, especially Catherine, Linda, and Jonathan, uh, who supported us a lot in preparing for today's event. We'd also love to thank the Terra Foundation for American Art, who sponsor this program and make daily conversations like this one possible, and who also support our growing archive, which you can view on the Rails YouTube channel. For 22 years, the Brooklyn Rail has provided a platform for the arts, culture, and politics through our monthly free publication and public events like our daily NSE. You can check the chat for a link to donate to support the rail. And if you're free on Monday at 1 p.m., we'll be hosting a conversation with Marilyn Minter, Andrew yes. Wolf, and Senya M. Sobaliva on the occasion of Minter's show at LGDR in New York. And we'll conclude with a poetry reading by Drew Ziba. And as is real tradition, you all can now turn on your microphones and say hello and goodbye as you leave. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much, Robin. Thank you, Jess. Yeah, thank, thank you, you so guys. much. Thank, thank, you. Thank, you. thank 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 you. Go see Thank the show. You. Thank you. Oh, in New York, if you're here. Yes. Yes, please. Yes. <laughs>